morning, church family. So good to be with you today. I pray and I hope that we will just enter the throne room with praise and worship more than we've ever done. And so will you join me? Will you please stand? Lord of heaven, I do not deserve grace that you have given and the promise of your word. Lord, I stand in wonder.
strength that carries me when I am on my knees. The cross reminds my heart to trust your faithfulness and love will always be enough. Sing you are. Oh, you are a fortress for the Heavenly Father, Lord, we trust you, Father. We trust you with all the things that we have to keep surrendering over and over to you, Lord. We know that you are in control of all things. You hold all things. And Father, I pray that you'd remind us of that today. We pray that we can rejoice and be joyful in you because you hold it all together. So we need not to worry because tomorrow has its own worries. And so, Lord, as we just are here today, gathered together for you. We pray that you would um, speak to our hearts, Lord, and just encourage us in the way that you want us to live. And we in, invite you into our, our thoughts, Lord. We invite you into our hearts. And so, Lord, just prepare us now and help us to receive your word. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. You guys may be seated. Good morning, Calvary Chapel, Panama City Beach. Nice to be with you this morning. Pastor Eric here filling in for your pastor, Pastor Anthony. And uh, we are continuing our study this morning in the book of Revelation in the 14th chapter. So if you'd like to turn there, Revelation chapter 14. Um, let's pray together and ask the Lord's blessing as we jump into his word. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the book of Revelation. Lord, you have uh, given us, Lord, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, you have given it to show your servants the things which must shortly take place, Lord. And you've uh, promised a blessing to those who would read and study this book and keep the things that are written in it. And so, Lord, we thank you for the message that you have for us this morning out of your word. We ask that you will just open our hearts, Lord, truly, and draw us close to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, as we're looking at Revelation chapter 14, it's sort of a, a pause in the chronology of uh, the time of the tribulation period 
Earth's final seven years of its history. It's still up in front of us, of course. And uh, the book of Revelation brings us to the end, the end of the world as we know it. And, um, you know, that kind of sounds like a bad thing, the end of the world as we know it. But really, uh, it's the end of the world without Christ Jesus uh, in the midst of it. The book of Revelation brings us to the return of Christ when um, Jesus will return to this earth and set up his kingdom and uh, the earth will be a, a blessing. It'll be so nice to be here and to be with the Lord. But before that happens, the Lord has to fold things up here, uh, sort of as life as we know it. So you guys are very much aware of these things as we've been studying this book for a while. But as we are in the 14th chapter, uh, we're given a series of, of visions, um, things like angels flying throughout the midst of heaven. Uh, the first angel is preaching the everlasting gospel, and, and everybody on planet earth gets an opportunity to hear the message that God loves them, that he sent his son Jesus into this world, uh, that Jesus went and died on the cross as a payment for the sins of the world, and that each person can be forgiven before God through putting their faith in Jesus Christ and choosing to follow him. So we see an angel flying through the midst of heaven in this 14th chapter with the everlasting gospel, and his message is able to reach every man, woman, and child on the entire planet. So that's a very thrilling thing as we see God really reaching out to lost mankind as the end is approaching. And even today, the Lord is reaching out to us and uh, his spirit is is reaching out to us and uh, God desires that we would all be believers in Jesus Christ and following him and so we see this angel with the gospel we see another angel uh, flying through the midst of heaven verse 8 of chapter 14 uh, speaking of the how this world system is beginning to fall and then beginning in verse 9 uh, we read uh, about a warning that is given by a third angel flying throughout the midst of heaven that there is to be no pledge of allegiance to uh, the Antichrist who will be this world's final leader. And so the warning of that, and you guys can read back over that if, if you're visiting for the first time today, you're sort of jumping in midstream in the middle of a study, but you guys can read back over that. But this morning, we, we've come to... Um, uh, verses 14 through 20, which is the final harvest. And we're given a vision here of the harvesting of the Lord. And we are going to see a, a harvest unto life, which pleases God, which is according to his will. We're going to see a harvest unto life, and we're going to see a harvest unto judgment. You see, man in his life has to choose which path he will take. Will, will he take the life that God wants to offer? Will he choose that path and be a part of the harvest unto life? Or will man refuse and harden his heart against the love of God and against the message of Jesus Christ and the cross? Will man harden his heart and then he's on the path to the harvest of judgment? So there will be uh, there will be a final harvest before Jesus returns. There will be a last chance to get saved. And we're seeing that, uh, this in the 14th chapter. And once that opportunity is gone, once that opportunity to be saved is refused, then there will only be a harvest of judgment left. I do think it's interesting here that the harvest uh, unto life comes first. Because that's what God desires. That's what God wills, the, the, a harvest unto life. So that comes first. Sometimes people stumble over the judgment of God, but the judgment of God comes second. God doesn't desire to judge. God desires to save. But if salvation is refused, all that is left is judgment. And so the Bible teaches very clearly that God loves the world and that he has given us his only son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, 
but have everlasting life. But if that message is refused, the only harvest that is left is a harvest of judgment. So we're going to be looking at these two harvests, the harvest unto life and harvest unto death. Uh, and so let's read uh, through this. We'll start with the harvest of life. Amen. And we'll look at verses 14 through 16. Uh, the scripture says, Then I looked, Revelation 14, 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, that's Jesus, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap. For the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So uh, he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So this is a reaping of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we spoke of the angel who flew through the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach, right? Right? So that message has gone out, and now Jesus is gathering in the fruit. He's gathering in those who, uh, he's bringing to eternal life those who are putting their faith in that message. This is the harvest that we are looking at. And this is all taking place right before the very end, right before the Lord comes uh, and the battle of Armageddon takes place. And so this is a harvest unto salvation. The, the Lord is reaping with the sickle. It's a, 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 a figurative um, image of the Holy Spirit working through the preaching of the gospel and people coming to faith all, all over the world. So in verse 14, as he, he describes this, um, he sees one like the Son of Man, and that is actually uh, Jesus there. And uh, the term Son of Man is used of Jesus 84 times in the New Testament. This is the last usage of it in the New Testament here. Um, so Jesus, uh, he is the one who is uh, on a white cloud and having on his head a golden crown. So um, Jesus will be seen later with diadem, uh, a crown of diadem that's like a king's crown. Here, the crown that is on Jesus' head is a Stephanos. It's a victor's crown. And I think that this is so, if you think about it, it's very exciting. Jesus is, is thinking of the victory. It's a victory for him to bring forgiveness and eternal life to people who are willing to believe in him and, and, and follow him with their lives. It's a victory unto the Lord. You know, the Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents. It's a victory for Jesus Christ to save a person from eternal damnation. doesn't matter what type of life or sin that person has been involved in. Sometimes we can look at a person and say, wow, that person's deep in sin. That person's dangerous or that person's really dark. Hey, that's the very person that Jesus loves. And uh, he considers it a victory to give them the gift of eternal life and the forgiveness of their sins. So here we see Jesus having on his head a golden crown, the Stephanos in the Greek. It's the victor's crown. And in his hand, a sharp sickle. Jesus is ready to save souls, man. <laughs> I love this. And so another angel, he came out of the temple and he cried with a loud voice to him, to Jesus, who sat on the cloud, saying, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So the angel is proclaiming that the harvest of the earth is ripe. It's interesting as you consider the word ripe because the, the idea there is that in the Greek, it's past uh, it, its um, ripeness to where it's most uh, pleasurable to partake of, but it's, it's like it's, it's starting to rot. You know, you can still eat it 
You know, we have, uh, my wife gets apples at Trader Joe's uh, every time she goes to the store. And um, if she gets a lot of apples, like if she gets two bags of, of apples, then, um, you know, we eat those apples. But then as time goes by, some of those apples begin to soften. And, you know, you pick it up and you kind of squeeze it a little bit and you start to think about whether or not it's going to be good to eat. And so the idea here, the harvest of the earth, it's past its um, excellent state and it's starting to rot. And what that speaks of is that this is, this is the last moment for the harvest to happen. If it doesn't happen here, the harvest isn't going to come in at all. And, you know, church, if you think about this, uh, the, the, the day of salvation, the, the true harvest time, the appropriate harvest time is now, right? It's the church age, the days in which we are living now. But you go on into the tribulation period without being saved, and, and you live through much of the tribulation period without giving your heart to the Lord. Then this angel flies through the midst of heaven giving the final call. Hey, this is the last call, guys. If you want to get saved, this is the last call. You know, after this, it's judgment in hell. This is the last call for eternal life. This angel flies throughout the midst of heaven, and truly, those who turn to the Lord at that moment, it, it's, it's past the, the glory of ripeness, and it's almost rotted. It's the last chance for, for people to get saved. And so, what a dramatic time uh, in the Bible. And, and um, so we look at this. And, and the, uh, um, so the angel tells the Lord, hey, thrust in your sickle. It's time for you to, eat, to reap <laughs> for the harvest of the earth is ripe, overly ripe. It's just about to be lost, right? So verse 16 says that he who sat on the cloud, that's Jesus, he thrust in his sickle to the earth and the earth was reaped. The final harvest of souls gathered unto the Lord. You know, it must be a glorious moment for Jesus. The final harvest. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the thief on the cross. Amen? During Jesus' life on earth, there was a final person to put his faith in Jesus Christ before Jesus uh, uh, gave up his life on the cross. You remember that as Jesus hung on the cross, that there were two thieves crucified, one on the right and one on the left. And as the people were looking at Jesus as he was crucified there, they were mocking him. And one of the, the criminals that was crucified next to Jesus also joined in the mockery, but the other one, the other one humbled himself and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise. And it wasn't long after that, that Jesus then dismissed his spirit. And the, the thief on the cross was the final harvest of Jesus's earthly ministry as the God-man in his human body before Jesus died. Well, here we have the final harvest uh, in earth's history take place. After this harvest, the judgment is going to come, and then Jesus is going to return physically to the earth. There's going to be no salvations once Jesus returns to the earth. Every soul that could be saved will have been saved, and uh, Anyone who's not saved will then have to face Jesus in judgment. So Jesus here, thrusting in his sickle and joyfully reaping. He's got the Stephanos crown, the crown of victory, joyfully reaping uh, 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 the souls, bringing people to eternal life through faith in him. So such a, an excellent uh, portion of scripture. I, I, I really, really like this. And, um, but you know, sort of as a, a way of application, you know, I, I think that the Lord truly uh, desires to be able to pass by our life as believers. Uh, I, I believe that the Lord likes to come to us and he likes to find uh, the fruit of his spirit uh, being brought to maturity within us. Uh, uh, he likes to 
sort of come to the garden of God and be able to pick the fruit uh, of our lives and, and to enjoy it. And, um, you know, it reminds me uh, of that parable that Jesus taught. He said, he said that there was a, a landowner and he said that this uh, landowner decided to plant a vineyard. And so he planted the vineyard. He put a hedge around the property he dug a wine press there in the vineyard, and he also built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers. And this landowner, he went away into a far country. The scripture says then that when vintage time drew near, when, when the grapes were ripe, when it was the season for harvest, when the vintage time drew near, the landowner sent servants to the vineyard uh, to uh, receive the fruit of, of the vineyard, those who had been working the land. And I think the, the Lord, you know, he desires to pass by us, amen, and to find that fruit of his spirit that he's been working to cultivate in our lives. And, and he loves to come and to see it and, and to experience it. You know, Jesus said, I am the true vine, Jesus said, and you are the branches. Jesus said, my father is the vine dresser. He's the one who is tending uh, the vine and the branches that it might bring forth fruit. And so Jesus said, you know, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bring forth much fruit. And he said, uh, by this, my father is glorified. You see that you would bring forth much fruit. And so um, I believe that God desires to, to pass by our lives and to find that fruit that his spirit has been cultivating within us. I, I think of our homes and I, I think of the fruit that the Lord wants to see in, in the midst of our homes. He, he wants to pass by and he wants to find the families worshiping him and loving him and seeking him and serving him. Um, he, he wants to, you know, to, to find the families uh, in a fruitful place. And I think it's such a, it's a rarity, amen. This is sad to say. It's a rarity to, to find families that are fruitful in the Lord. But there are many in, in the churches, uh, uh, and, and I think it, it glorifies God. I think of you know, the, the, the fruitfulness that God desires to see uh, in marriage and um, the, the, the harvest that God desires to bring out of the marriage. And so as God has instructed, you know, husbands, love your wives like Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the word. Listen to this that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. You know what, guys? God desires, men, God desires that we would seek, by, by God's power, that we would seek to love our wives, that there might be fruit in the marriage on account of us, the husbands loving the wife, it speaks of the wife uh, uh, or the church here. The church and the wife are commingled in, in the statement here uh, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives. You see, guys? And so God wants to pass by us. He wants to pass by our homes and he wants to see our wives standing in that place of, uh, 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 of nourished and cherished and without wrinkle or spot or blemish. He wants to see our wives in that, that beautiful place on account of the love of the husband that is just present and, and poured out and, and active. I believe it brings glory to God and, and it's what he desires. May God help us uh, and bless our, our, our homes in this way. And then, you know, the Lord has instructions for the wife. And, and the scripture says that uh, the wife is to see that she respects her husband, right? 
She's supposed to be supportive of her husband. Now, guys, it's difficult for a wife to be supportive if you're not walking with God. That, that's difficult, right? Because your wife wants to support you, but if you're making bad decisions, it's hard. You can't support that. So let's just take into the consideration the wife supporting the husband who's doing his best to, to follow the Lord. He's not a perfect man, right? We'll be perfect. In time. He's not a perfect man, but he's doing his best to follow the Lord. Hey, wives, God desires to pass by our homes and to see the fruit of a wife who is respecting her husband and supporting him. It will glorify the Lord. I was talking to my friend uh, Bob today. Uh, Bob is married to uh, his wife, Audrey, and they've been married for uh, 70 years. And um, uh, that's right, Bob is in his 90s. And uh, they've been married for 70 years, he and his wife. And so Bob was talking to me about going to school uh, to learn to be an engineer uh, at Purdue. And he was talking about uh, some of the challenges that he faced uh, in, in accomplishing his education at Purdue as an engineer. There were some very difficult classes. And um, he said, of course, Eric, he said, God helped me tremendously. He says, but I'll tell you what. He said, I never would have made it without the support of my wife. He said, my determination wasn't enough. I needed my determination. And I, he said, I needed the support of my wife. He said, together, we were able to accomplish my education. And so it just spoke so wonderfully about the, the support of the wife and, and what the man can become because of the support of his wife. And so, you know, Bob went on, uh, you know, after he graduated with his engineering degree, he went on, this guy, literally, he could build you a nuclear reactor in your backyard if you needed it, okay? Uh, he was talking about some of the work that he had done on nuclear reactors and how companies from uh, uh, halfway around the world uh, sought his expertise uh, in, in working on nuclear facilities. And so, you guys, you need to see this. <laughs> the fruit of that, it stemmed from his vision and desire of what he felt that God was calling him to do, but the support of his wife. If the support of his wife was not there, he never would have been able to become as fruitful as God desired. You know, ladies, the Bible says, a wise woman, she builds her house, right? But a foolish woman, she pulls it down with her own hands. The value, the value of a supportive and respectful wife to the husband, it allows the Holy Spirit to bring the fruitfulness in the husband because of the support of the wife. So ladies, you have a, a tremendous place as well as men, you have a tremendous place. Hey, the story goes on with Bob and Audrey. Um, so Bob had his career, his engineering career. His wife had a high school diploma. They got married uh, during World War II. And so his wife has a high school diploma. Well, as you know, uh, life goes on and they have a family and, you know, own their own home and these sorts of things. Then his wife decides to go to school. And so his husband, uh, her husband, Bob says, well, I can support that. And so Audrey went back to school and she got her bachelor's degree. Then she went on and she got her master's degree. Then she went on and she got her doctorate. And uh, she even lived among the Indians in uh, Mexico uh, for some time because her doctorate was, was in uh, the, the um, I can't think of the name. But uh, so her husband supported her living among the Indians of Mexico to earn her doctorate. He would drive down to Mexico on the weekends and try and rig up things like electricity and the little shack that she was living in and doing these things for her. So you see, it goes both ways, doesn't it? And so 
the fruitfulness of the husband and the wife, it's as Jesus is the center. And, and as the love of God is then presented towards the spouse. And, and, and then the fruitfulness that comes in that. And so, uh, you know, I just, we, we, as I study Revelation here and in these things, I, you know, in this passage, I just really felt led to, to talk about uh, some of these things. And it's a little bit of a diversion from the text, but um, I think that, I think that the message this morning is carrying the heart of God uh, for us all. So, let me flip back here to, to Revelation chapter 14. The fruitfulness of God's Holy Spirit as Jesus desires to pass by and find that fruitfulness of his Spirit in our life. You know, if, if you're hearing my message and you're thinking, Eric, I, I want to be fruitful, but can you help me how? How can I become fruitful? Well, let me just say this, and then we'll move on to the next paragraph. You know, being in the Word of God, right? Isn't that what Psalm 1 says? That he who meditates in God's Word, he shall be like a tree that brings forth its fruit. Being in the Word of God, having personal devotions in God's Word daily, that is your, that is your best effort in, in allowing God to make you fruitful. There's a fruit of prayer. There's a fruit of coming to church. Good job coming to church today. Where, where are the people that should be here that are not? Hey, coming to church makes us fruitful. Um, and so the work of God's Holy Spirit through these things encourages and, and makes us fruitful. Uh, Philippians talks about the fruit of righteousness which are by Christ Jesus to the glory and the praise of God. It's through the power of his spirit at work in our lives as we seek him through the basics, man. Word of God, prayer, fellowship, learning to serve, praying with other people, getting encouraged by others. Uh, God uses it all. It's glorious. May the Lord bless you. Well, we've studied verses 14 through 16 the first judgment, the first judgment, it is the first harvest, the first harvest. It is a harvest unto eternal life. Last chance to get saved. The last call was from the angel. Now the Holy Spirit is bringing in the final harvest. Jesus with his sickle is bringing it in. Well, then we come to the final judgment uh, uh, in verses 17 through 20. This is as um, the nations are gathered to the battle of Armageddon. And so this harvest here is looking towards the harvesting of the earth of unbelievers. It's, people are gathered to the battle of Armageddon, the area of Megiddo, the valley of Jezreel in Israel. And this is where the Lord Jesus is going to return and, and judgment is going to be made. So we look at this, verse 17. It says, Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried out with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. This is the people, the vine of the earth. This is referencing the unbelievers that are a part of the vine of the earth. They're not attached to Jesus. They're a part of a wild vine. So the angel, one angel says to the other, thrust in your sharp sickle, verse 18, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the ripeness for judgment is fully ripe here. And so we read that the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and he gathered the vine of the earth. There's that statement again, the vine of the earth. And he threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and the blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles 
for 1,006 and 600 furlongs. So this, this vision here brings us to Armageddon. Now we'll look at Armageddon uh, later in chapter 16, and we'll look at it again in chapter 19. It, it will actually see the Lord Jesus Christ return to the battle of Armageddon and to slay his foes there. But this is sort of a, it's a vision, it's an announcement of what is coming. And so this angel uh, gathers the vine of the earth. Now Jesus has gathered, uh, gathered the harvest unto eternal life, but after these souls are in, then there's nothing left but unbelievers who refuse to repent. We're going to see that as we move forward in Revelation now. There's a refusal to repent. Nobody will repent. Nobody wants to repent anymore. So the, the only thing that's left then is for the angel to gather the people together uh, for judgment uh, uh, in the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon is earth's last day. <laughs> okay. It's its last 24 hour period, the battle of Armageddon. That's when Jesus comes and physically slays his enemies. And so this is what's being talked about here. Uh, the angel thrust in his sickle, verse 19, and, uh, to the earth, he gathered the vine of the earth and he threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God and the wine press was trampled so the trampling of grapes in the wine press you guys all can probably remember the I love Lucy episode of her trampling the grapes in the wine press the wine press was trampled outside the city outside of Jerusalem this takes place in the Jezreel Valley the Valley of Megiddo which is near uh, it's in the north of Israel um, so the wine press was trampled outside the city and the blood came out of the wine press up to the horses bridles for 1,600 furlongs or 185 miles. So this judgment that takes place at Armageddon, it will be massive. The blood comes out of the Valley of Megiddo for uh, it's four feet deep up to the horses bridles. For 1,600 furlongs, or that's 185 miles. And so um, how this is going to actually take place, uh, we'll, wait, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. We won't be there. We'll be returning with the Lord, but, but we won't be a part of this bloodbath. Um, but 185 miles is basically the distance from Dan to Beersheba. And so perhaps the, the, the blood of, uh, of the slain uh, makes its way into the Jordan River or, uh, you know, and, and it, it speaks of this, I'm not sure. But I, I would like to read to you from Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah 63 prophesies of this very day and it's sort of a question and answer format. And so listen to this, Isaiah 63 verses 1 through 4. The question goes out, Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. Then the answer comes back. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. And then the question comes back. Well, why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? And then the Lord Jesus answers. I have trodden the winepress alone and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger, I have trampled them in my fury, and their blood is sprinkled up upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed, the kingdom age, the year of my redeemed has come. So guys, listen, God is both a God of love and he is a God of holiness okay so god in his love has given his son jesus christ to die for the sins of the world that anyone who would put their faith in him might be forgiven and have eternal life okay and so we see jesus in the first harvest harvesting uh, souls unto eternal life but he is also a god of holiness or a god of justice 
which means that he must judge sin. And so when forgiveness and eternal life is refused through Jesus Christ, then judgment must come. And so the choice is up to us. God, his choice is to extend the opportunity of forgiveness to the world, but it's our responsibility to make the decision to personally put our faith in Jesus Christ, to believe in him and to follow him. That's the decision that each of us needs to make on our own personally. Going to church is not making that decision or calling yourself is not a part of making that decision. What you need to do is you need to personally receive Jesus Christ into your life you need to ask him for the forgiveness of your sins and you need to commit yourself to following him. And as you make that decision, God will receive you as one of his children and he will give you the gift of eternal life. And so I pray that you might make that decision today. And as we close in prayer now, if you would like to make that decision, we will give you the opportunity. So let's pray together now as we close our service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the message today, Lord. We see that the harvest unto eternal life comes first. We know that's what you desire more than anything else. We do understand, Lord, though, if we refuse the offer of salvation, that there only remains a certain fearful expectation of judgment. And we know that you don't want that. And we don't want that, Lord, in the lives of people. So we ask, Father, if there be any who are among us today or are watching online who have yet to make a personal decision to believe and follow you, we ask that you will help them to make that decision now. And so with every head bowed and all eyes closed and no one looking around, if you're here today and, and you're not sure if you would go to heaven when you die, you're, you're not sure that your sins are forgiven, would you like to pray with me right where you're at? Would you like to pray with me and say a prayer and ask God for the forgiveness of your sins? And you can know that when you leave today that you have eternal life, that you have become a child of God. Would you like to pray and commit your life to following Jesus Christ, if you would, repeat this prayer after me now and God will receive you. Let's pray together. Say, Dear Jesus, I believe in you. And you just pray those words after me if, if, if you would like to receive Jesus Christ today. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. And I desire today to begin following you. I pray, God, that you would forgive me for all of my sins, for I am a sinner. But I ask for your forgiveness. I desire to know you, and I desire to follow you. I ask that you will help me now. God, I pray for eternal life as I choose today to believe in your son, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. And it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, God bless you. Let's stand together. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer today, if you opened your heart to Jesus Christ, hey, listen, God has come into your life. And I would encourage you to share the decision that you made with someone there. There are leaders in church that are there. And uh, they would just love to encourage you and to help you in any way they can. They're not going to ask you for anything. But if you prayed that prayer to accept Jesus Christ today, um, the, the leadership of the church would like to know so that they can encourage you. And they'll be praying for you. So I think I, I ask this all to stand. I just want to pray for you, Calvary Chapel, Panama City Beach, beloved of the Lord. Dear God, thank you for this church, Lord. Thank you for these people. Thank you for the homes that are represented here. Oh, Lord, bless your people. Yes, God, we desire to bear fruit. Yes, God, we desire that as you should pass by our life, you should find the fruit that, that you desire. 
And so, Lord, strengthen us. Thank you for giving us vision. Thank you for comforting us and giving us hope. We pray that your hand, Lord, will be upon each one of us. And we pray that fruitfulness will increase in each of our lives to the glory of God. Father, we pray that you will remember your servant Anthony and his wife Desiree and their children. Lord, we ask that you will make the way and grant the recovery. Lord, that you would open your hand and satisfy this desire, Lord, of raising your servant back to his feet. And so, Lord, we just thank you for these things. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's family said, amen, amen. Well, all right, God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.